Welcome back to the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. Today I am having on Ruth Ann Zimmerman. If you are in the homemaking, homesteading niche, follow along with all of that, you probably have heard of her. She shares a lot about her homestead and homemaking, her garden. She has so much wisdom to share. We're going to talk about value as a homemaker, how that relates monetarily, but then so many other aspects of it. She has a ton of good information to share, and I just really enjoyed chatting with her. So join us for this interview. My name is Lisa, mother of seven and creator of the blog and YouTube channel Farmhouse on Boone. Join me as I share with you my love for creating a handmade home from scratch cooking and a little mom and entrepreneur life along the way. All right. Well, thank you so much, Ruth Ann, for joining me. You've been a requested guest many times over the years because you are in this homestead and homemaking space. A lot of people, I think, really look up to you. And so I think that's why we've uh, we've ended up with you here on the podcast, and I'm very excited. So let's start with some introductions. Tell me a little bit about you and your your farm, your family, or whatever else you want to share. Well, thank you for having me. We, my husband and I live on 21 acres in Northeast Iowa and we have seven children and I like to say I didn't set out to be an influencer. I stumbled upon the Instagram app and started sharing, you know, just little things I was doing and the influencer life kind of caught up to me. (laughs) So that's kind of where you find me today doing what I have been doing for the last you know, 20 years of being a homemaker and sharing bits and pieces online on social media. Yeah, that's always the best kind to follow. One that you're, you're actually, this is what you would be doing if it wasn't for there being a camera. This is your life. And we know that because of that, you have a lot of knowledge and wisdom to share because you've been doing this for many years. It looked like your kids were Maybe some of them are around my kid's age, but some of them a little bit older. So for many, many years, you've been doing all of this stuff, and then you started breaking out the camera a little bit later. Yes, that's right. And our oldest is 21, and our youngest is six. Okay. So yeah, so yeah, shifted a little bit on mine, about literally six years on both ends. (laughs) (laughs) So you're about six years behind me. Correct. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. So the topic that I want to talk about today, and I don't think my listeners ever get sick of talking about this topic because so many of them are in similar situations to you and me, but about six years or 10 years behind me is what I find a lot of my audience lies within, not not everybody, a lot. some of them are my age as well, but a lot of them are learning this homemaking thing and then also trying to find their value in their role as a homemaker. And that's something that you share quite a bit about. You actually had this Instagram reel where you talk about this. And I think it it did pretty well or it, it caught a lot of attention, probably because so many of us, we want to be sure that there's value in what we're doing. So we're going to talk about that, believing in your value as a homemaker. Is this something that you were always committed to being a homemaker and how early on were you able to see value in it or how has that changed over the years? So growing up in the Old Order Mennonites, where women are rarely, if ever, expected to have a job after marriage, homemaking begins after they're married, and they put all the skills to practice that they've used, you know, that they've learned under their grandma and their mom. And so I really, like, I kind of stumbled upon it because when we left the Mennonite culture and I then I became influenced by my generation. And so I'm an 80s baby. So Me my too. generation is very <laughs> career oriented. And so then I became influenced by that and started looking for ways because we had left, you know, the old fashioned world. I started looking for ways to add value to what I already had because I I tried to push away the old-fashioned skills that didn't line up with the modern world. So in in doing that, 
I started feeling less than because everybody else my age in the modern world or, or a lot of my peers had careers. And so I started looking for ways to make money. And I, you know, I, I started an Etsy shop. I did very well with the Etsy shop, but I was doing it by compromising some of the other areas of homemaking. But at the time, it didn't matter, you know, because I was bringing in an income so we could afford to buy all our food from the grocery store. Right. So it seemed to kind of balance out. And then God brought us three little boys in two short years. And there was no time for anything except, you know, uh, being a homemaker. Mm -hmm. And so I started looking to refine, like I had to search to find value in just, in not bringing in an extra income and not having a title other than homemaker. Because this, these little boys needed me. And I, at the time, had two teenage daughters. And it was an intense time. Mm -hmm. And God just kind of started whispering to me that, I have skills, like my skills and resources bank is completely full. And so slowly that began my journey back towards, okay, I can use my skills and I can save more money by using my skills than I can make. Mm -hmm. So by, you know, by gardening and canning and using the skills that I already had, I was able to make a bigger difference in our budget than by, you know, working in my Etsy shop or having a part-time job, you know, or, or any other stream of income. Yeah. That's something that occurred to me pretty early on whenever we were, we were first married. I, I didn't actually put numbers to it because I, I, I wonder if you have, like, have you, did you actually put numbers to this is what I'm bringing in with this extra work that I'm doing. And this is what I'm saving by cooking from scratch or whatever other things that maybe you filled in there. Did you ever run those numbers or just seem that it worked out sort of in the budget a little bit better? I never ran the numbers because for me to be able to continue to bring in an income through Etsy would have required daycare for my three little boys. Right. So and really, yeah. that price, I mean, I would have probably had to pay a premium because they were a lot. <laughs> so I, you know, I never, I was just like, oh my goodness, daycare would be so much or even hiring somebody to come in so that I can sew for a couple hours a day. Like I, I wasn't making enough. And then, yeah, so it, it was kind of a no brainer to me because my values or my standards as a mother, I didn't want to compromise my standards as a mother by having somebody come in and take care of my children or take them somewhere for somebody else to watch. That wasn't how I was raised. And I knew that would be compromising my values. So when we, even when we start adding in those kinds of emotional costs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's more to it than just the monetary difference. That's for sure. Yes. Yeah. That, yes. And that's probably why I never really ran the numbers because there wasn't there wasn't another option. I wasn't going to do anything but be a homemaker. But it did seem like we were able to live on a lot less, like a whole lot less than the average family could and quite comfortably. And I never I I never really I guess at the time put together just how much I was saving our family with a lot of the things that I was doing at home. All right, I want to take a quick break from this episode to tell you about a sponsor for today's episode, Azure Standard. I first learned about Azure Standard probably over a decade ago when I first started getting into real food. I was seeking out sources for wheat berries in bulk. Like I wanted a 50 pound bag because I had my own grain mill and I wanted to make my own bread, honey by the gallon, all kinds of dairy products like organic grass fed butter, things that I was not able to find locally or if I could, they weren't in bulk. I wanted a better option so that I could be obviously more economical to purchase these things in large quantities and then to stock my pantry well. That's something I'm very passionate about is keeping the staples stocked so that no matter what, if there's a big 
snowstorm or anything, I'm able to have what I need to at least make a lot of basic things. And through all of my years of learning how to do a lot of these types of homestead, homemade things, I'm able to take those staples. Anyways, the company that I found was Azure Standard. And what I like so much about Azure Standard is it works like a co-op. So there are drops all over the country where several people get together so that they can get a large truckload for a lower price by combining the shipping, combining the purchase. We have a local drop that is about 30 minutes from us in either direction. There's several actually drops that I could be a part of. And once a month I place my order for by now I actually do animal feed, I do organic raw cheese, a huge block of it. They don't just have bulk. If you're a small family, you're not ready to really stock up. What I like so much is they have quality. So you can find your organic sour cream, organic cream cheese, any of those specialty ingredients that you don't really wanna to go to Whole Foods for because it's really expensive. I can find it as your standard and I have been utilizing that for many years. Azure Standard is offering Simple Farmhouse Life listeners a 10% off your first order coupon. So you can go to azurestandard.com and use the code SPRINGHOMESTEAD10 to get in on that discount. Make sure when you go onto the Azure Standard website, on the front page, check out the seasonal produce. A lot of times, they will have a large amount of whatever is currently in season for a really low price. So if you're looking for some bargain shopping or just something that's really fresh straight from a great source, make sure to check out the seasonal produce. And then if you're like me, you're going to come up with some staples that you get over and over again, that it's very automatic. Just add this to the cart. Again, azurestandard.com, use the code SPRINGHOMESTEAD10. Again, thank you so much to Azure Standard for being a continued supporter of Simple Farmhouse Life and a great company to source your food from. So what are some of the things that people are in your culture growing up that moms taught their kids to do? So a very general and I don't know if you would even call it basic because now with the comments I get on my Instagram, I'm like, oh, a lot of people don't even know basic housekeeping. <laughs> so yeah. there's just this mm -hmm. routine in the culture of, you know, you're, you wash your windows at least once a month and, you know, you do laundry at least twice a week and, and you clean the whole house every Saturday so that it's clean for the weekend and, it's just, it's very structured. Their homemaking okay. is very structured. Yeah. That's so different than how I've done things. But do you find, and maybe you haven't tried it the other way, I'm not sure. Do you find more freedom in that structure and knowing exactly when to expect it? Like, for example, I, I used to, for a little bit, have a schedule like that. And then I was, it was too difficult for me to maintain it. But if you know you're cleaning on Saturday, maybe you have less worry about certain things that you see on Thursday or Friday in your house because you know you're going to get to them on Saturday. Do you find more freedom with that kind of structure? Well, I think one of the one of the main reasons they are structured like that is because so Sundays you often invite guests over after church on Sundays. So that's why okay, you yeah. clean on Saturday because and you you know you prepare food on Saturday for Sunday and they don't they don't work more than they absolutely have to on Sunday. So that's one of the reasons that they'll, you know, that they clean on Saturday. And personally, we rarely invite guests over now for, you know, after church. So I would say that yes, I have a lot more freedom, but the level of cleanliness is still the same for me. Like, oh, my windows are filthy. I've got to clean them, you know, this week. Um, so, you know, the level of cleanliness, the standard was set in childhood mm -hmm. and I still have a lot more freedom. And this is how I know, because if my mom's coming over, I'll take a whole day just to clean the house because I'm not as good of a housekeeper <laughs> as she as she was so so i definitely have a lot more freedom but it's also because our lifestyle has some different habits than the mennonite culture has okay yeah there's a very high value placed on this cleanliness which i wasn't aware of i don't clean windows once a month but i that would 
that would it probably brings a sense of order into your home whenever things are running that way very efficiently. Well, and even it doesn't matter what culture you're in, you're going to find value in the standards. So, you know, let's say, you know, the homesteading culture, everybody measures themselves up against somebody, right? And and that's just how we value how, I mean, that's how we judge how good we're doing or, you know, how bad we're doing. And in the Mennonite culture, where the women are primarily homemakers, their identity is often in what kind of homemakers they are, who mm-hmm. makes the best meals, you know, who ha- who serves the brightest yellow pasta. You know, they mm-hmm. all have an identity, who makes the best quilt, whose windows are never dirty. Like, it's just <laughs> women. It doesn't matter what culture you're in. Right. And in in that culture, if that is what women are, homemakers, they're they're gonna try and outdo each other in in homemaking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. What other types of skills did you come into marriage with? Cooking from scratch, I'm assuming, maybe sourcing things or keeping a budget. Um, cooking from scratch, definitely, and gardening. Gardening was. Okay. That was a big one because we, my mom had a big garden and we helped a lot in the garden. So gardening and cooking from scratch and then just general housekeeping, keeping a budget. I don't remember being taught that other than at school. And that probably varies from family Mm -hmm. to family, but I definitely think work ethic and just having a real structured life are definitely two of the things that were imparted to me from a young age where if there's something to do, you, you just do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one of the top questions that I get a lot and that people submitted for this episode in particular has to do with that and managing everything, getting everything done. I'm sure you get this all the time, but how do you manage it all. Do you feel like that is just the the work ethic piece or maybe the way that you schedule things out? You're a homemaker, a parent, a homeschooler, homesteader. You have your your YouTube channel, your Instagram, and I know what goes into all of that. You're you're on podcasts sometimes too. So how are you able to stay so productive and how do you structure this? Is is a question I'm sure you get all the time. So we can start we can talk about that here. <laughs> I think one of the biggest skills to have in when you're doing multiple things is learning to prioritize. And that to me looks like every day. And I have my three top, I have my three top priorities and I measure everything that needs to be done up against those three. And then I decide what happens next, like just do the next right thing. So my top priority is the emotional well-being of my family. So that has to come first. And if that means, you know, if if you have little ones, that's going to take up a lot of your day. And then everything else fits around the edges. And you don't grow, you don't take on more responsibility than what your priorities allow. So if you, you know, if you have preschoolers, making sourdough bread is not going to be a priority. Meeting their emotional needs. If you have a baby, that happens first. And then if you have time, then you add making bread, you know, things like that. So the emotional well-being of my family is my top priority. And with our baby now being six, that's why I have so much time for other things. But it wasn't Mm -hmm. always this way. Right. Because he now can come find me when he has a need. And, you know, his needs might look like standing at my elbow and me chatting with him while I continue to do what I'm doing. And he'll, you know, he'll join in. But his emotional needs look so much different than they did when he was six month old, because I no longer have to drop everything to see to his needs. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of a lot of what young moms that have babies a lot of what they're seeing is an illusion because social media is so, it's just hard when you're trying to find your identity. We know it's hard Mm -hmm. for teenagers. And anytime you're at a new stage in life, you are, you're going to fall victim to what you see on social media. 
because you're going to start measuring yourself up against something that isn't real life. And then you're going to feel like you're you're not measuring up and then you're going to have, you know, feel like you're a failure. So that's where a lot of new homesteaders are right now is they are falling into that trap of comparing themselves to something that's not real life. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And it's definitely a, a problem. And I think we should definitely unpack that more because that's a constant struggle for moms in general. And it it can lead to some of this productivity. So, you know, with, with that, you have your family's needs ahead. Are you able to create a loose schedule or a list of priorities for a day that sometimes just don't happen. You do end up getting quite a bit of stuff done. So when are you fitting? I guess it's different now since you have your youngest is six, but when are you able to actually fit it in? Like, do you have a structured day? Um, Are you asking things like cooking? and taking care of the yeah. animals. Okay. Yes, so- and and cleaning the windows once a month and <laughs> just keeping a lot of those plates spinning. And then with kids, especially with the age ranges that you have, there's probably a lot of just random stuff for each kid that you have to keep track of. Like maybe they're in a sport or even if they're not, they have some interests that they care about that you're in some way involved in. I'm positive. So yeah, I guess, yeah, keeping all of those plates spinning around your home, around your kids. So that that all would fall under the emotional needs of the family. And here, our children, I don't homeschool anymore. Our children attend a private Christian school. So I'm not responsible for their academic education. Okay. So when your babies are little, you're not you don't have to wonder what their emotional needs are, right? Yeah, it's they, pretty straightforward. They, <laughs> it's pretty straightforward. And as they get older, I would say around sometime between 8 and 12, you'll you'll start having to be real intentional about seeking them like seeking them out. When they don't need to touch you all the time, you need to start being more intentional about seeking them out. And once you're comfortable and you're used to seeking them out, those things happened with everyday life. So their emotional needs get met while you're doing all the other things. Like you can chat when you're, you know, milking the cow or, or if you, you know, feel something's going on with one of the teenagers, you just stick your hands in that soapy dishwater right beside them and you start chatting with them. So the emotional needs of your older children actually fit into the homestead a lot better than with your infants and toddlers because you just bring them alongside of you and you connect that way. And then... As far as keeping all their plates spinning as early as possible, you hand that plate to them and say, mm-hmm. this is your responsibility. And I'm sorry that you forgot, but you know, let this be a lesson. So I'm always handing those plates to them as this is your responsibility. I'm sorry that your school shoes are all muddy now because you went in the garden when I did, you know, this isn't, you know, what happened this morning. So now you have to spend extra time cleaning your shoes, but your shoes are your responsibility. So, you know, constantly trying to hand those plates to them for them to pick up some of that responsibility. Yeah. So the emotional needs come first. And then next for myself is the nutritional needs because, The nutritional health is very closely linked to the emotional health in our family. And when we eat junk, we act like junk. So nutrition for my family is right up there at the top. And that looks like me, you know, milking my cow, making the, doing all the things with the the dairy, Mm -hmm. making the cheese and the yogurt and making that bread and and cooking from scratch. And that takes up a lot of time. Mm -hmm. It's very time consuming. Yeah, it does. And then <laughs> after after all of that, then comes housekeeping. Okay. And the housekeeping only things come to the top like this. Like if I have if I can't have joy because my windows are so filthy, then it's time for me to clean my windows. So everybody's <laughs> standard of housekeeping is different and and my housekeeping things slide to the top as they start stealing my joy. 
So right. if my kitchen is messy, I can't even think of cooking in a messy kitchen. So, you know, keeping my kitchen clean, that that's pretty much a priority because otherwise I cannot meet the nutritional needs of my family because I don't even want to be in my kitchen. And then we're, you know, running to pick up pizza because mom doesn't want to be in the kitchen because the kitchen's messy, you know. So, mm-hmm. so it all kind of sifts itself out as far as housekeeping. But if it's affecting my joy and my ability to serve my family, then it has to become a priority. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. I have a lot of things around the house like that. And then it's also letting some things go that you know you could be doing. That's what I sometimes fall into the the trap of. I will figure out this new project that I want to do. And really, (laughs) keeping up with all of the things that you just talked about, there's very tiny bits of time left. So when you have a project like that, where does that fit in? Is that a late night thing? Or are you just maybe devoting 10 minutes a day to something whenever you want to knock out something extra that doesn't fall into these rhythms? Or do you just basically let them go? I think you're right. A lot of them I have to choose to let go because I only have so many 5 a.m. mornings to work mm-hmm. with. And right. and I have to be comfortable I'm creative enough that if there is a creative seed in my mind, I sometimes have to get it out. Like if I'm writing something or I have a deadline and if I don't get it out, I tend to be irritable and short because it's bugging me. And that's when I know, okay, this has to be a 5 a.m. in the morning kind of project. And some people are night people. I am not a night person, but I'll get up at 5 a.m. and fit that in. But Yes, if it, if there's no room after I've spent so much time doing meeting all the other neat priorities in my family, if there's no room for one more thing, then it's it's got to go. But oftentimes you'll find on the homestead things will will fit into categories. So, you know, it's not a big deal adding another milk cow when you're already in the barn every morning and it might just add 10 minutes to your morning routine. I'm glad you're saying that. this because we're literally doing a second one as of today. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know where you remember where mm. your first milk cow, it added a whole hour to your morning routine every day. Yeah, the whole thing. Yeah. And then, you know, then it was the mental stress of learning everything right. about her mm-hmm. and adding another one. Literally, you already know everything about cat, not everything about cows, but you're in yeah, the routine the basics, and you yeah. know what to watch for. And it literally as much time as it takes to have them switch stalls and to milk Norma. That's her second one. That's how much time it added to our routine. And nobody barely even noticed that mom gets up 10 minutes earlier. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's really good to know. We've had the two cows for a while, but the one just had her calf three days ago. And so we've never had both of them freshened in milk. And anyways, we're doing something different with the calves, which when I talk too much about this, it, it gets controversial and such. So what I'm going to say is we're going to have a lot of milk. <laughs> As of today. So, yeah. My husband actually, I think he must have gone on your blog post and he was reading me all about you um, the other night. And I'm like, oh, we are very much the same. Yeah. <laughs> we, do, we do the same thing with, with our calves. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, yeah. And we haven't so far because I like the flexibility. But the, the thing is, is, yeah, I have flexibility, but I don't have what I need. And I, don't, you know. Most of the time, we don't need flexibility because we have seven kids, so it's not like we're flexible. So anyways, yeah. Well, and the the thing is, you're always going to spend something. Whatever you want, it costs something. It's either going to cost you time and effort or money. Yeah. And you're either going to put in time and effort and have all the cream and butter that you want, or you're going to spend money going to the store to buy the cream and butter that you want. Like Mm -hmm. it. It's just a matter of what do you want to spend? Yeah. And the third factor, which is the most important for me, is I can't get endless supplies of raw cream from any dairy around here. Sometimes they'll have it. It's $20 for a half gallon jar. But most of the time, they don't even have that. Like, I don't know if they sold it for 50 if they'd have it, but 
it's not even possible, even if I wanted to shell out infinite amounts of money, I still can't get it. I can get at the most half a gallon a week and that is not gonna cut it of the cream. So anyways, yeah, it's 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 time, it's money, you're right. There's always a trade off there. That's the same thing with the the value we were talking about earlier with the homemaker. And when you know you're not home, there's a lot of things that do just simply cost a lot more. But then there's also you can't even get this stuff. You know, a lot of the things right? that you're making at home, if you're learning how to make sourdough bread. I can't in my area, maybe if I drive to the city, which is an hour away, I can't get sourdough bread. So it's not even possible. And that is that is exactly the same inspiration that our gra- that drove our grandmothers to do what they did. Right. Because they weren't able, you know, why pay the money when you have the skills? Like they were much more willing to use their skills than than to spend the money the money for whatever they needed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they saw they saw the value in it. And when I look at grandmas, I don't know the age of your grandma, but I always tell the story of I have one grandma who was about twenty years older than the other grandma, just because of the when she, one of them had my dad and when my dad had us and whatnot, versus my mom. So the one was this kind of grandma you're talking about, and maybe in your Mennonite culture, (laughs) this is all grandmas, but actually most of us who were born in the 80s and 90s, our grandmas were the first generation that did live out of cans and just completely, I mean, we'd probably cook more from scratch than, than my grandma, the other, the younger one did these days in general as a culture, because that was when you know, it became very accessible to buy a lot of these things. So people really latched onto it because we didn't see the consequences of all of that. I want to take a break from this episode to tell you about today's podcast sponsor, Carly Jean Los Angeles. I just picked up several new pieces for springtime. I wanted some dresses that weren't necessarily maternity, but were high-waisted enough that I could wear them throughout the rest of this pregnancy, as well as postpartum. And that's what I love about Carly Jean. They have these pieces that really work through different life stages. So they don't they don't technically sell maternity or nursing, but I can go through the pieces and find things that work for me in multiple seasons of life. So I'll wear these when I'm not pregnant, I'll wear them when I'm not nursing, but I can also wear them now. They have these beautiful capsule collections that they piece together in order to make women able to look beautiful without having to put a whole lot of effort in, which is what I love so much about Carly Jean. I love about a capsule wardrobe in general because I don't have a lot of time to put together an outfit every day. I actually just got done organizing my closet. I took out all the clothes that were only for winter, like heavy sweaters, but I did keep some of my Carly Jean, these long sleeve cardigan, they're like lightweight knit that could transition me from spring or from winter into spring and summer. And I I love having this pared down closet to where when I look in it, everything can mix and match and it's just very easy to pull something out and be ready for the day. Carly Jean is a small company based in Los Angeles. I've actually met their founder, Carly Brandon, a mom of four. So fun to support a family owned business like that. All the basics are made in the USA. Carly Jean is offering Simple Farmhouse Life listeners a 20% off coupon for your entire order. It's a one-time use code. You can use the code FARMHOUSE20 over at CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com. I know you will find several things that will carry you through whatever season of life you're in, help you to look beautiful easily. Again, that's CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com, FARMHOUSE20. So I guess... One of the topics we wanted to talk about was learning from our grandmas. How are we going to pass this down whenever most of our grandmas aren't even in that situation? We'd have to probably go to our great grandma, especially for the younger listeners, to even find anything like what you're talking about. I feel like a lot of the skills fell into this giant abyss of convenience, And they just tumbled one skill after the other into that abyss. Because like you said, our grandmas were the first. And in the Mennonite culture, most people are a whole generation behind the modern world. Right. So So grandmas are still the, the one I'm talking about. Yeah. Yes. And then say my mom 
probably embrace the convenience of it all. But then, so she, my mom had nine children. So she went through the whole cycle through her motherhood. So she embraced the convenience but then by the time us younger ones were growing up, she was circling back around to, oh, look at all the ingredients on that cereal box. So I kind of, you know, I, I've kind of watched her embrace it and then circle back around. And I've done the same in my, you know, in my own journey to embracing who I am as a homemaker is you know, I've embraced the convenience when, you know, when we weren't in a lean time and we had extra money to spend, you know, what would that feel like to buy the convenience foods and then being shocked at the, you know, at how it affected our, our physical health and our emotional health, not, you know, not even counting how it affects the budget. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I think what will make the biggest difference in making sure that these skills don't fall into that, that abyss is just by pure exposure. Our children have to know that it can be real life. So our children, you know, they go to a private Christian school and they are very different from the things they eat are very different. Their, their lives are structured very differently because of the homestead. So number one, our children have to be comfortable with being different, but then they have to choose for themselves the value in the kind of like homesteading lifestyle. And, and we all have to get to a place where we're comfortable with if my children never eat chicken that was, you know, raised out in the pasture, if, if they're, in, if they in their adult life choose to never eat that kind of chicken, I'm going to be okay. And it's <laughs> yeah. not going to affect our relationship. <laughs> number one, we've got to get to that point. And then number two, we have to, Understand that by just mere exposure to being able to raise chickens, it is going to put them a step ahead of all their peers because that's what happened to me. When I remember early on in my childhood raising chickens and my grandma would come over and help us butcher them. But then later on through my, you know, probably from the time I was 10 until the time I left home, we bought our chicken from the grocery store. But when I circled back around to raising our own meat, I was not at a loss. Even though I had never butchered chicken since I'd been 10 years old, I knew that it's possible. And with a couple of phone calls to my mom, I went ahead and did it. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just being exposed to it and knowing that it's possible. Yeah. And you brought up a, about, you know, them change or not wanting to do a lot of this stuff. And that happens with a lot of kids. How do you feel that you're conveying the value of it? And so that it's not just seen as extra work. And this is not just to our kids. I think about this with, you know, people in, who are your YouTube audience or your Instagram, conveying the value in these things, instead of just just the extra work associated with it, so that it actually looks like a positive it all comes back to your why. Like, let's take one of my sons, for instance. He's at the stage where he says, I am never going to raise chickens. And I think to myself, <laughs> you're a foodie. And it's not yeah, going to take be able you to find long. The food you want. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to take you long to be like, oh, this chicken is disgusting. And, mm -hmm. you know, and then the journey back to, to the roots begins. <laughs> and... Another story, our daughter and son-in-law, um, they live locally and we raised some hogs and we said, hey, do you want half a hog? Because they, you know, they'll come over and milk our cow when we're gone, you know, things like that. And they always say, oh, no, we don't want to be paid. So, hey, can we gift you with half a hog? And they came over the other night and they're like, we started eating from that pork in the freezer. <gasps> it is the best pork we've ever yeah. had, you know. <laughs> and I'm like, yep. And that's how the journey back begins for the foodies. It's not hard to have find value. Now, I'm not a foodie, and I can tell the difference in the food, but my goal is to not have the skills get lost. So that's what drives me. Everybody has to choose it for themselves why they want to do it. And if it's just because you want to fit in or because it looks like it's fun or it looks cool, 
it's you're going to be exasperated and it's going to feel like way too much work. But if mm-hmm. you're valuing yeah. the nutritional value and I don't know what what's your where do you find value in it? Is it nutrition or is it skills? What is it? It's it's definitely more nutrition than the other things, because I can tell a difference, but I also wouldn't care enough like you. I wouldn't care enough, to be honest with you, to get eggs from the store and the the dairy. I mean, cream from the store and raw cream. I mean, they both whip up. It, they it just it wouldn't make me that much of a difference for me. It is the nutrition. And then I would get like my entire homemaking. I've been married for 15 years. I I would not not to say that there's not plenty to do because there is plenty to do. I don't want to say like, oh, I'd be so bored. But like in a way, when I'm not learning something new, I don't feel fulfilled completely in the role. I really do get a lot of satisfaction from learning something new. And so, yeah, I'd say it's the skills, but primarily the nutrition. I could always find other skills (laughs) to take. I probably would. I'd probably just sooner do more sewing or something if it wasn't for the nutrition part of it. I think that's what a lot of young homesteaders and and young moms, I think that would be a great starting point for them is to sit down and say, okay, why, what is my drive? Like, what is the motivation behind this lifestyle? You know, why do I want to do it? And then, and then keep that in focus and take little steps towards that. And I'm, I'm much like you. I like a challenge. Right. And that's how I feel alive is when I have a challenge or when I have more plates to balance than I than any anybody thinks I can. You know, so mm-hmm. part of that, you know, that's part of my drive. But definitely I'm motivated by nutrition. And the, that's what motivates me to get out of bed and go milk those cows, because right. otherwise I have to go to the grocery sco- store for milk. And that's not an option. No, that's not an option. And we've always gotten raw milks for 15 years we've sourced it and only in the last two have we had it on our farm here but I just can't get the quantity that I want and it's very it's you know you know as a farmer that there's times when the cows are dry there's just that's like the one thing I need control over and then I also really love with with dairy that you have a fresh constant supply so if I do go to a farm you might get like seven or eight gallons all at once but then by the end of that week it's not really fresh. Whereas when you have your own cow, you have ample supply. And then you also get a very regular, fresh supply of it, which to me is, that's a big drive. (laughs) It sounds like you're on the same learning curve as everything else when you take it back. Like we're, we're a generation that's used to having everything at our fingertips. And, and we're used to having a constant supply of something. We're not used to eating according to the season we're in. So, you know, if you were accustomed to, you know, going to get raw milk and having as much as you want all the time, the learning curve comes in when you're now your cows dry. Well, hopefully you made enough cheese in, in, you know, when she was giving a lot of milk and that's for my, that's the same learning curve I'm still on. And I feel like we've already mastered or we're accustomed to eating what we can grow like okay now we're out of pork that doesn't mean we're going to go buy pork we will just not eat pork until our next pigs are ready for harvest right Mm -hmm. you know whereas whereas the in our generation like it's hard to tell the family no we're out of bacon no i'm not gonna go buy bacon we can wait you know, and I, I feel like I'm in the same spot with our dairy because I've just recently learned how to make hard cheese. So it's hard to to tell myself, okay, so this is like when all the green beans are ready. If I'm getting three gallons a day, then I better be making butter and cheese as fast as right. I can <laughs> for the times when I'm only getting one gallon and we're only getting enough to drink because I don't want to have to go buy cheese at the grocery store. Yeah, that's something I'm still in the process of learning because we've never... We've never not calf shared and had more than we could, you know, know what to do with, but that's all, that's all coming. So I'm really hoping that I'm decent at this whole cheese thing. I'm going to, I'm going to (laughs) learn, but we're the same with pork. I don't, we don't raise it, but my sister does. And we went through what we bought from her 
or almost. And she said that the next one will be ready in the fall. And I'm like, that's going to be a long time without bacon. I mean, we'll, we'll buy it very occasionally, but we will not have the access to it like we did because I can't find, I can't find good quality bacon, at least not for who knows how much money that would be. I don't even know. They, do they even have that? <laughs> Ours will look like this. So I'll see that we're low. So I'll hide the last couple packages so that I can make it stretch, you know, a little farther. Yeah. And then we'll run out of bacon. And then if my husband goes to the grocery store, he'll buy a pack here and there yeah. to, you know, as a kind of a special occasion. But it's the same with chicken or beef or, or anything. If we run out, then we'll just discipline ourselves. We have plenty of other food and we don't always have to eat everything that we like. Right. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. You can you can make it on some of those cuts that maybe aren't your favorite too. Learning to cook them and cook them well yes. is all yeah, part of the process. I got a lot of questions specifically about homemaking. And one of them was, what are some of your homemaking rhythms? You shared a few, but I'm curious what like a regular day if you aren't adding you know those 5 a.m mornings to to do some other project or passion or whatever what hours does this take because people always say do you ever sleep are you able how are you able to fit this all in are you able to keep your home milk the cows raise meat garden all of these things within the hours of seven to seven or how specifically does that look for you I'm sure it changes by season. It changes a lot by season. And I'm usually out of bed by about 545, just because my children get up at 615. So okay. I like to be up a little bit before them. And everything else fits in usually before 8 p.m. I'm pretty well okay. done by 8 p.m. And and it, it all comes down to prioritizing and just doing the next right thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But but the other thing, and I, I talked with Amy about this um, last week on the Homesteaders of America podcast, this, this is a lifestyle that I was born into. Many, mm -hmm. many young moms are learning from scratch. You know, they're, they're starting right from that starting line. I was born into this lifestyle. So a lot of what you know, what I'm doing, it takes no brain space because right. it's second nature. Yeah. And, and once you practice something so often and it becomes second nature, it doesn't, it's just a rhythm that you get into and it doesn't take so much energy. Mm -hmm. I talk about that all the time. There are so many things that I think back to 15 years ago and what it took for me to get the same outcome. And then now mentally there's that hurdle of even getting started on something because you don't even know exactly what you're supposed to do. And once that becomes second nature, you're just going throughout your day. You know exactly what you have to get done. And I know people want specifics, but it, it changes and you get to know your own situation, your own farm, your own home, your own kids, your family. And so it's hard for you to even convey to me, well, this is how it looks because it's just this rhythm that you've grown into over the years. And it does look like you know, constant all day. There's probably not really any time throughout those hours that you're just sitting down hanging out, but you know what to do in that. And, and people have to figure that out in their own homes. And today, especially with the way we consume media, the way, you know, you and I share too, a lot of times we want, this is exactly how you do this whenever there isn't really an outline because you your situation is going to look a lot different based on where you live your a lot of a lot of factors it's like your homestead especially when it's not just you and your husband like especially when you have children that are old enough to have opinions i mean even babies have opinions but each homestead takes on a life of its own and the same way as i wouldn't sit here and tell you exactly how to train and nurture your 5 year old because he's a completely different person. Your home and homestead is going to take on a life of its own, and only you know what rhythms and systems work for you. But the other thing that a lot of young moms and homesteaders fall into is into the abyss of convenience also fell 
the community. So, and that's where social media comes in and can either be a huge blessing or it can be exactly what discourages people because communities were designed where when you're at the very beginning of something, you're going to look around and you're going to copy what this person is doing or what that person is doing because you don't know what it should look like. Let's take, for example, when I was in brand new to cheese making, I watched so many different people's tutorials on making hard cheeses until I was completely overwhelmed. And before even trying it, I had decided that I probably couldn't do it. That's probably where so, I am right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to try, but yeah. <laughs> But in in a natural community, you would have found an aunt or a mm-hmm. grandma or a mom, and you would have watched and, and you would have learned from that person who cares about your outcome, you know, the outcome of your pro- product. And so that's where social media can be discouraging and make us feel like we failed before we even began. And it's the same reason that social media is so detrimental to the teenagers because they're beginning their whole entire adult life. Mm -hmm. So then they're bombarded with, with people that have the perfect body and the perfect life. And they are, without even trying at adult life, they already feel like they've failed because they don't look like this and and it's the same trap that we can fall into anytime we're new at something. When we're new to motherhood, we can feel like, well, my baby doesn't sleep all night. So then I must have somehow failed. No, your baby is a completely different person. My homestead doesn't look like her homestead, you know, or my cow doesn't give as much milk as her. So I must be doing something wrong. Where in a, a real life community would walk much closer with you and they would be much more of a support than I can be to anybody that follows me on social media. Yeah. I want to take a break from this episode to tell you about one of our awesome sponsors, Toops and Co. That's T O U P S and Co. I've had a few questions about that lately. They're like, what are you saying again? All of the sponsors will be linked down in the show notes as well as on simplefarmhouselifepodcast.com. But Toops and Co. is an organic skincare company that I couldn't speak more highly of. I actually just did my makeup because I like to do my makeup before I come out and record, no matter what kind of day it's been. I have the Toops and Co. foundation, the mascara. I'm trying to remember what else I have. I have several of their things and I absolutely love it. It's really hard to find a foundation, especially that is both quality and good for you. I've struggled with that for years. I even dabbled in making my own for a while. It was really greasy, sort of worked out, but definitely did not have the quality of Tube Cinco where I actually feel like I'm wearing a foundation. I also really love their skincare products. So I love their cleansing oil. They have this tallow balm that especially in the winter, I'm starting to not need it as much. I would go to my little tallow balm container five times a day. I just left it out on my bathroom where I pass by often and put it on my face all throughout the day. Now that it's not as dry because we're not running the wood stove, I'm able to do it like once a day and I'm totally fine. But such a luxurious balm that moisturizes the face, but then it also has all natural and organic ingredients, which is really hard to find quality and something that works. Tubes & Co. is offering Simple Farmhouse Life listeners a 10% off discount by using the code FARMHOUSE. So head over to tubesandco.com, use the code FARMHOUSE to save 10%. I know that you're going to absolutely love their products. A little goes a long way. I haven't had to replace them for a while. I'm almost ready to replace the foundation. And I do a different shade from winter to summer. So I'm in that transition phase of like, I almost need a slight shade darker, which is a good time to get a new foundation. But I know that you are going to absolutely love it. Again, tubesandco.com. Use the code farmhouse. What are some of your, your wisdom over the years of managing that? That's, I've tried where I'm not going to consume social media in any way, shape or form. And then I've tried where, you know, and then there's a lot of things that you miss out on with that, or there's various pitfalls that I've found, but yeah, managing that is tricky, especially if someone doesn't have an aunt who knows how to make cheese, which I would venture to guess 99.9% of us (laughs) don't have an aunt who knows how to do a lot of the things that we want to learn, or if we do 
they might not even have the time to invite us over and show us. So that's not happening in real life. Yeah. What are some of the ways that you have figured out through your years of managing some of that? I think the number one thing is to leave social media exactly where it needs to be in your life. And for young homesteaders, in today's day and age, that looks like finding somebody that's offering exactly what you want and make sure they're experienced because sometimes we find, and I'm going to try to be real gentle when I say this, sometimes (laughs) there's an excessive amount of instructions and words to make up for lack of experience and skill. Yeah. So, Mm -hmm. so find, find your people that are willing for me and cheese making. It was Kate at venison for dinner. She offered a Mm -hmm. course. Yes. And with the course, she offered that she would be there to answer any questions and to help us succeed. So that to me was worth the money because I knew that I could get a personal connection and that I could email her and say, okay, Now this happened. How do I troubleshoot this? And, you know, so use social media to find your people that are willing to give you the the handholding that you need and and then just consume their information. And then once Mm -hmm. you're confident in cheese making and we're just using that as an example, you can apply this to gardening or, or child rearing or anything. Once I became confident I developed my own system and my cheese making now has taken on a life of its own. Mm -hmm. And, but she's still always there. If I need help, I know I can go to her. And that's the kind of community that mimics the community that most of us are missing. It's those people that are, that are offering and willing to help you, regardless if it's three months later, they'll still be there to answer your questions. Mm Mm-hmm. I like that idea too, because you don't get this overwhelm because you can do a lot of different processes. I haven't gone too far into cheese making, but I know with a lot of things that I've done, there's 15 different ways to get almost the exact same outcome. And that's where you're like, but they did this and they did this and ah, this is, this is terrible. And yeah, so I think that that's really good advice to find someone who is further along than you in whatever you want to do. They have success, they have experience, and then just latch onto that and (laughs) do what they say. And then over time, when you know what you're doing, that's when you can start to bend it into your own thing. And that's, that's exactly what happens. Like, oh, maybe if I did this part, this would work a little bit different for me. And you try it and turns out it kind of does. And so you make it work for your own situation, but without that sense of overwhelm in the very beginning, which happens with every area of all of this, even down to just like your homemaking rhythms of how to clean your house, we can get overwhelmed with people's different laundry systems and feel like, oh gosh, now I don't have a clue how to do the laundry, you know? And and then end up feeling like a failure. And regardless what age we are, we fall into that comparison game and we're just as vulnerable as our teenagers are when we are beginning something. And, and it doesn't really matter what your laundry system looks like. The only time it really matters is, is it affecting the way that you can, emo- can meet the emotional needs of your family? If your laundry is affecting the way it, that you can meet your emotional needs, the emotional needs of your family, then yes, find somebody to give you some tips and how to structure your, your laundry so it doesn't take control of your entire life. Right. But if, if the clothes are clean, if the cheese tastes good, it, it ultimately it doesn't really matter how you how you reach that end. <laughs> it it really doesn't in in your homemaking it'll take on a life and a shape of its own. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's all so true. And I hope that we've inspired people to take the next step. You you keep saying keep just do the next right thing and whatever that looks like for you, you will figure it out. Don't be discouraged. And uh, it is a lot. Uh, Keeping all of these plates spinning, it's a lot. And it takes time to figure out what kind of systems will, you know, get you to be able to accomplish that end result of your of your laundry and your home not affecting the emotions of your family, which is, you know, at a minimum what we're all going for. 
So share with us where to best find you, what you offer. I know that you're on YouTube and Instagram. So yes, I'm on YouTube and that fits around my family. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so my family is on YouTube and I, I try very hard to make it, you know, fit around you know, meeting their needs. But my goal for YouTube is to put the information, Instagram happened first. And then in my messages on Instagram, I find what people need. And then my YouTube looks accordingly. A lot of people want to know how to make yogurt. Okay. I'm going to put together a um, YouTube video on a, on the different ways to make yogurt, even though I know there's a hundred and 200 some out there already on YouTube, but that way I have somewhere to send people so that I'm not answering the same question over and over yeah. and over again on my Instagram. So I'm on YouTube. I'm on Instagram. My Instagram messages, as much as I love all of you showing up there, I have not been caught up on Instagram messages in probably 18 months. So for <laughs> yeah, those of you that are hanging out there, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> and then I'm working on eBooks. I have one eBook that I have done and that's on my website. And that one is the old fashioned approach to childhood chores oh, that's um, because cool. I get lots and lots of questions about how to get kids to help with chores and what, what are appropriate chores. So I've, I've put that one together and that one's on our, my website, which is just ruthanzim.com. And then I have an email subscribers list where I send out weekly emails and I go more in depth on some of my YouTube topics, or I might talk about things that Instagram doesn't want me to talk about. Mm -hmm. I might put that in, <laughs> in an email and send that out. Awesome. We will leave links to all of that in the show notes or the description box um, based on if you're listening on the podcast app or over on YouTube and people can go find out how you're managing all of this and maybe get some tips and inspiration. Thank you so much, Ruth Ann, for joining. Oh, and I also forgot to mention, I think you're speaking at the um, Homestead Conference this year, aren't you too? I will. Yes, I will be at the Homestead Conference in October. And then I'm also speaking at the women's event the women's retreat. I'm not, I can't remember what they yeah. call it in November at Polyface Farms. And that one's also oh, cool. hosted by Homesteaders of America. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Well, thanks again so much for coming on and sharing all your wisdom. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. If you enjoy this podcast and you have not yet left a review, I would appreciate it so much if you're on, um, I'm not really sure how it works on different apps. I always just use the Apple app and it's pretty simple to just leave a little review. You don't necessarily have to write any comments if you don't want to. I would really appreciate that. It's, it's how I tell Apple or tell the podcast apps that people want to hear this podcast. And so it really helps out a ton. All right. I will see you in the next episode.